Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Council Committee on Veterans Fiscal 2020 pre prelimin Preliminary Budget Hearing. I am Councilman Chaim Deitch, Chair of the Veterans Committee. Today we'll be hearing from Lori Sutton, the Commissioner of Department of Veterans Services, or DVS. Thank you, Commissioner, for testifying before the committee today. The Department of Veterans Services Fiscal 2020 Budget totals $5.2 million including $4.2 million in personal service, service funding to support 47 full-time positions established by Local Law 113 of 2015. The department is now in its third year of operation. DVS is an important institution with a mission to ensure that the concerns of the New York City's over 200,000 veterans are heard and addressed. Now that the agency is up and running, it is the job of this committee to make sure that DVS is making the best use of its resources and fulfill this mission as best as it can. With the goal in mind, uh, we hope to gain a clear understanding of DVS's efforts to identify what are the most pressing concerns for the New York City's veteran community and what actions the department has taken to confront these issues. We would like to develop a better picture how and how to DVS is collecting, analyzing data and how the recent launch of VetConnect will impact these efforts. We would like to gain greater insight on the day-to-day -day of, of operations of DVS community outreach, mental health, and homelessness prevention program areas, and want to learn more about the work DVS does in the realm of veteran employment. Um, I would like to thank um, the following, uh, uh, fi uh, financial analyst Zach Harris, committee counsel Luzette Saudry, uh, uh, policy analyst Michael Kurtz and my deputy chief of staff who is here, Tova Chasanoff. And uh, I'd like to recognize uh, my colleagues, uh, members of the committee, uh, Council Member Matthew Eugene, Council Member Alan Maisel, Council Member Paul Vallone. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for being here once again today. And I would like to ask the uh, committee council to please swear in the commissioner. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Good afternoon, Chair Deitch and esteemed members of the New York City Committee on Veterans. My name is Lori Sutton, and as always, I'm honored to serve as the founding commissioner of the New York City Department of Veterans Services. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner Jeff Roth, and legal counsel Eric Henry. We are pleased to testify at today's preliminary budget hearing. As you know, DVS was created in 2016 to facilitate access to and coordination with organizations and entities throughout New York City that serve our veterans community. The agency has grown remarkably over a few short years in both staffing and reach. Since inception, the agency has gone from a staff of four to a current complement of 36 with multiple employee hires expected to occur in the near term to fill our 11 remaining vacant positions. Our staffing reaches across focus areas including administration and operations, outreach and employment, assistance, peer mentoring and whole health services, veteran homelessness, press and communications, legal and intergovernmental affairs, and public-private partnerships. In the design of this new agency, our strategic operational model includes the use of information technology to drive di digital innovation of traditional service delivery as a critical component to increase DVS reach to the city's veteran community. Our VetConnect NYC platform, launched in November 2018, is what we veterans like to call a force multiplier. VetConnect NYC serves to connect veterans, active military, National Guardsmen, reservists, and their families to a growing network of vetted, veteran-centric, service providers through the personalized hands-on efforts of a coordination team of social service professionals. Organizations in the network span the range of life needs in areas including legal services, housing, mental health assistance, education, and employment. We will continue to evaluate our capacity to grow VetConnect NYC and our technology infrastructure systems to meet needs and strengths of our veteran community. Our proposed fiscal year 2020 budget of $5.2 million is essentially flat as compared with the modified FY 2019 budget, barring the addition of one new position who will serve as our legislative advocacy uh, specialist and serve as an ombudsman to facilitate effective communication and timely action with respect to city council discretionary funds allocated to increasing community veteran services. 
While it may appear that our OTPS budget has been reduced, this also remains static as we are working with OMB to shift appropriate funding for the Pay for Success initiative to FY20. Pay for Success is a three-year employment <coughs> outcomes project, which I'll describe in greater detail later in the testimony. At the heart of our agency's mission is direct outreach to our nearly one half million veteran and veteran family population. Connecting with these cherished citizens is a challenge as they are a divergent group spanning in age from their early 20s to centenarians like Manhattan born but Brooklyn raised Sidney Walton, whose 100th birthday we recently celebrated at our office. Our varied population has experienced radically different military and wartime experiences, returned home with unique medical and mental health conditions, and most poignantly, communicate and socialize in distinct and predictably disparate ways. Our population, not all of whom self-identify as veterans, is also spread out over the 302 square miles of New York City's five boroughs, presenting additional challenges to providing critical in-person outreach. We are tackling these challenges by developing a multi-pronged communication and outreach approach to convey relevant and meaningful information about the programs and services specifically targeted to different segments of our veteran community. We are also growing our social media footprint, including our new SITREP podcast series. We've got a new version that's coming out this week, a new episode, I think it's episode number seven, and we have 16 that have been recorded, so more to follow. Other actions in progress include increasing visibility within the outer borough community radio, newspaper, and broadcast platforms. I'd like to just briefly summarize some of the subpopulations of our community that we reach out to uh, engage and assist. First of all, our post 9 11 veterans. At the last uh, committee hearing, we talked about the Veteran Success Network uh, with three pillars uh, designed to cre create pathways to employment and education. Uh, mentoring, as well as to business and entrepreneurship. Reaching out to veterans of all eras, we are excited to uh, describe our recent uh, merger, creating the engagement and community services team. This increases our capacity to conduct comprehensive in-person outreach. And while this merger has temporarily limited our outreach team's capacity to process assistance requests, as, re as is reflected in the 2019 PMMR, uh, we fully expect this team to not only regain its former capacity, but actually become stronger as VetConnect NYC merges, correction, VetConnect NYC matures, and we complete the staffing and cross-training for this new team. Unemployed or underemployed veterans diagnosed with PTSD at the last hearing, we, we described the Veterans Employment Pay for Success Project. It's another example of how our city is taking bold steps to find creative solutions to address New York City's veteran employment needs. This is the first ever cross-governmental pay for success project in the country that brings together city, state, and federal partners. And it is the second ever pay for six program, success program to be operationalized in our city. Veterans with mental health needs. Again, we covered this in extensive detail last testimony, but just to briefly recap, Vets Thrive NYC is a program aimed at increasing help-seeking behavior and social engagement, moving the front lines of healing from clinic to community. DVS uses a collective framework, collective impact framework, featuring its coordinated care network, Vet Connect NYC, that ensures veterans and their families can access whole of life services through expanded access and connection to care services and resources. In light of the ongoing national veteran suicide epidemic, we are also incorporating the Columbia Protocol, a leading evidence-based tool to identify risk and prevent suicide for widespread dissemination and use within the NYC veteran community. We also, as we talked about last time, we conduct mental health first aid training combined with the work that DOH and H has done and DVS has done. We have trained nearly 500 individuals in the MHA for veterans module. Further, this training takes place out in the community and it's available to anyone who is interested in either just taking the training or becoming a train the trainer. Homeless veterans, uh, we continue our campaign to end veteran homelessness through peer-to-peer -peer assistance. We have, over the last three and a half years, moved 680 veterans into permanent affordable housing. 
our housing resource generation efforts. We've worked with NYCHA to be the first city in the country to pilot a program to house disconnected veterans and their families who are not eligible for VA housing assistance. We're also moving more veterans into the city's affordable housing stock. Since the team was formed in calendar year 2015, there's been a 64% increase in veterans approved for Mitchell-Lama housing and a 90% increase in veterans moving into NYCHA housing. I just want to give a, a brief shout out to Local Law 23, and I know Council Member Vallone, that was uh, a, a bill that you championed and it, re it reflects our growing capacity to be able to identify how veterans and who among our community is using city services. Our housing stability services providing the essential aftercare and constituent teamwork day in, day out. I just want to read, there's a little success story here and we get these stories on a regular basis, but let me just share this example of a veteran we housed just last month. Ms. K is an Army veteran. She's struggling with severe PTSD and generalized anxiety, panic disorder, and depression, but she's not eligible for VA health care or housing assistance. When our team started working with Ms. K and her husband on December 14th last year, they had been homeless for 842 days. We are so proud of our team. On February 4th, just seven weeks later, Ms. K and her husband moved into their own home with one of the special new vouchers to ensure that one, their rent is subsidized in perpetuity, and two, that she gets the mental health treatment that she has earned. Moving on to women veterans, this last year we're so proud of being one of the partners that brought together the dedication ceremony for the first monument ever to honor the service of women veterans in a national cemetery. We will continue our efforts to reach out to women veterans knowing of their particular needs and strengths. Moving on to LGBTQ veterans, we are painfully aware that many of our LGBTQ veterans were discharged with less than honorable status and as a result may not qualify for the array of federal and state benefits, but I am pleased to say that here in New York City, no veteran who applies for city benefits is ever turned away from consideration due to discharge, sexual orientation, length of service, or any other identifier. We had a chance just this last week to go and uh, meet with the SAGE folks at their Manhattan Center, and I know that we are going to deepen our work going forward, and uh, they are currently being vetted as a provider for our Vet Connect NYC network. And Mr. Chair, I know that you've recently met with the SAGE team as well, and I thank you for your support. Vet veteran families, caregivers, and survivors, this is an area recognizing that nobody serves alone, families serve too. We're a member of Elizabeth Dole Foundation's Hidden Heroes Initiatives. We also work with the Tragedy Assistance Program for survivors as well as the American Red Cross Military Veterans and Caregiver Network. Uh, through presentations, scheduled appointments, uh, walk-ins, a 24-hour national hotline for survivors, this is a population that we are, are increasingly uh, working together both locally and nationally to in, enhance our connectivity and our assistance. I've been recently appointed to the uh, Federal Advisory Committee on Families, Caregivers, and Survivors, and I look forward to sharing these best practices as well as bringing best pra practices back to New York City. Finally, just like to highlight our important partnership with the DVS, I, DVS and the city's v Veterans Advisory Board. I see Joe Bellow here today, our secretary, and there may be others from the Veterans Advisory Board. Diverse range of service backgrounds, um, professional expertise to help facilitate dialogue. We just held our last VAB meeting this week at the Veterans Innovation Lab led by James Hendons, who's here today and supported by NYU. We are very excited about our uh, new and refreshed VAB with the continuity of our continued veterans who are continuing to serve on this important board as well as our new members. I would just ask you, check out the VAB annual report. It's on the DVS website and it really illustrates the care and commitment that the VAB brings to their, their work. In closing, DVS firmly believes that all veterans, men and women and their families are our cities and our nation's leading natural renewable resource. What's to be renewed, their commitment to and their capacity for continued service on behalf of others. We look forward to discussing with you how we can 
best support our veterans in finding resources and services that will provide them with a renewed and continued sense of purpose, mission, stability, and community. I thank you again for providing me this privilege of representing the interest of New York City's veterans and family members with you today. At this time, I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, first, um, I just want to thank the uh, Veterans Advisory Board for their annual report. I see a lot of work was put into it. I didn't uh, completely read it. I'm halfway done. Uh, but I look forward to, um, to reading it over and over and over just to, to get uh, information that uh, they worked so well and really went through and, you know, how much work they went through to put this together. And also, Commissioner, I want to thank you um, for your follow-up on, on uh, several of the, some of this, the last uh, several hearings on doing outreach, uh, for one, on the GI Bill, letting, um, uh, making sure people take advantage of the GI Bill. I saw you've already retweeted, Chair. Yeah, we got, we got it. Perfect. And uh, as well as um, the Thrive NYC um, mental health support for veterans. So that's extremely important. A and also from, you know, coming out of the last hearing, um, I, think, I think a lot was accomplished in regards to Thrive. I've met with, uh, with, uh, with Susan uh, Herman, and she did say a lot of work needs to be done, and um, she already followed up with giving me a full report. Um, I think it's almost complete, actually, on the services that they provide within my district. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done. She apologized for the, um, for the lack of outreach uh, that she has done, not only in my district, but throughout the city. And she's still new. She just came in a few weeks ago. And she, um, we're going to give her a chance to prove that, um, that the information gets out, that people get the services uh, that they deserve through um, reading about it, knowing about the mental health services that Thrive NYC um, has to offer. So we still have a lot um, to do on that, and I know there's a hearing now coming up with Thrive NYC, where there's going to be there's an oversight hearing uh, that, again, to, to we need to make sure that the funding, the, the funding that they have is, is well spent and well publicized and to make sure it's getting to the right people. So I'm glad that came out of the last hearing. Um, so a DVS has a budget, a headcount of uh, 47 full-time positions. And as of February, uh, DVS has uh, 38 active employees. Uh, this is a 19% uh, vacancy rate. Uh, what current uh, vacancies are there at DVS? Sure, we've got uh, 11 vacancies at present, and of those, we have four that have been posted and the postings have been removed, and now they're going through the process of interviewing. That would be for the Chief Information Officer, Director of Housing Initiatives, the Assistant Commissioner of Engagement and Community Services, as well as the Human Resources Generalist. We also have uh, currently four postings that are online, the city's uh, 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 platform for, for job postings. There are two postings for engagement and community service coordinators, as well as a posting for our digital outreach manager and a senior policy analyst. And then we have three additional positions that we're currently uh, putting together the position uh, descriptions and we'll be posting within the next week to 10 days. Uh, so what is the process that, um, like how soon do you think these positions uh, will be filled from when you, you post that, when you, po you do the postings and then when you get well, the eligible the time, candidates? Yeah, it's a good question. From the time that we remove the postings, we go through a very involved interview process. It's a three-stage process where we ensure that members f from across our agency are able to uh, meet within three rounds, tiered rounds of interviews, and we have a matrix and uh, formal uh, formal reporting procedure. Uh, typically that takes anywhere from two to three weeks depending on how many candidates we have and how difficult it may be to schedule and to, to, to align calendars. From the time that we have selected our top tier, maybe the final three candidates, that's when Jeff as Deputy Commissioner and myself will interview the candidates and then we'll proceed to uh, 
make our final, final ranking and turn it over to HR for actual negotiations. So it's, it's a process. I would anticipate that for these 11 positions, given that four of them are already to the point where they've been posted and we're currently ranking the candidates and bringing them in for interviews, I would guess that within this next quarter, uh, th certainly through the end of this budget cycle in June, we will have our, our full complement back on board. I will tell you that it's important to note that with any startup, there is always attrition for a variety of reasons. Uh, and we're very much aware of this. This is one of the reasons why we invest so heavily in training and team building and our culture, but there is no question about it uh, that for every individual who is drawn to work in a startup, uh, not every individual, uh, it turns out, is ideally uh, prepared or able to work in a startup. And even within phases of a startup, I, I've had the privilege of, of uh, starting up several organizations during my professional life, and there are some predictable uh, uh, phases where individuals who just you know, worked so well during the honeymoon phase, let's say, but then as the organization starts getting a little bigger and you start having processes and it becomes more formalized and more professionalized and, you know, uh, some of the folks who, who, who thrived early on, perhaps it's not a good fit going forward, but we, we take great pride in building a capable, talented, diverse team of DVS staff members and we, uh, we work with them every day to help equip and prepare them to best serve our veterans and their families. Thank you. Where do you post uh, these job opportunities? Yeah, so we post them on the city's site. Uh, you want to add anything to that, Jeff? I kept, uh, LinkedIn as well as uh, just uh, word of mouth recruiting as well. Do all the like um, the VIB members, the advocates, do they get uh, an email uh, about these openings? So they could spread it, spread around this. Um, yeah. We generally put the postings in our newsletter as well, and the VA members are uh, uh, receive that. So I, I just want to, I just would like to recommend if you could if you don't mind if you could send it out to all the advocates uh, to see maybe they know someone because they, they they work on these issues each and every day. So I think if anyone has a good candidate, I think we could get something from them. And we're talking we're constantly talking about uh, bringing more job opportunities for veterans. So this way we could spread this around in the veteran community to hire potential veterans. Just like in, uh, in other committees, I always fight for the veterans. Um, surely in the veterans committee, I wanna make sure that the veterans have the first opportunity to have some of these, to have these job openings. Absolutely, Chair Deitch. And ju just as recently as this last week at our VAB meeting in Brooklyn, I had a chance to s sit with the VAB and I let them know about some of these positions as well as then I uh, informed the group that was there for the public part of the hearing. And we'll continue to send that out more broadly so that, you know, that veterans or veteran allies, veteran colleagues, members of our community are aware of these vacancies because we're looking for the best ta talent that's out there and we, we look forward to uh, hearing from folks. Uh, is, is the priority to hire a veteran? We, on our job postings, we put veteran status is a plus, but we also know that, in fact, early on, Chair Deitch, uh, in building this team, I was asked, Commissioner, are you hiring all veterans at DVS? And I thought about it for a moment, and, and I came back and said, actually, yes. We are hiring all veterans of service. Some of us have served in the military, others in public service or community service, but service is our North Star. And when it comes to military veteran service status, it's about half and half right now within our agency. And we really feel that having a team of folks who have served in the military, we have many folks who are spouses as well as have direct family members, as well as those who are drawn to help work with this worthy population. So it's a, it's a team approach. Yeah, and I understand. So I appreciate um, the response, but um, the only thing is is that when like, for example, if I go to um, speak about uh, affordable housing for veterans, right, and I'm constantly advocating for veterans, 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 no matter what committee I go to and who I speak with, so when they look at me and say, oh, but the veterans, 
uh, DVS doesn't have all veterans, so how are you advocating for veterans when DVS themselves don't have all veterans? So it just makes it a little more difficult. So I just want to um, let you know that if in the future for these rest of these vacancies, if we could try to target specifically to the veteran community, so this way we give the veterans the job. Veteran status is a plus, Chair Deitch. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. In everything, you know, all other factors being equal, tie goes to the veteran, no question. It, th there's no, like, um, law against not targeting veterans, right, for these jobs? No, not at all. No. In fact, the federal VA, I think it's less than a third of, of their workforce is actually of veteran status. But I, I want to push back a little bit on the notion that it takes a veteran to serve a veteran. Uh, Phil Cly, who lives here in New York City and has written widely about his experience with redeployment, uh, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a couple of years ago that I think is so poignant. He talked about how so often there are these artificial boundaries that separate veterans and non-veterans, and sometimes veterans can kind of put up these barriers and say, hey, if you're not a veteran, you know, you can't, you can't relate to me, or citizens will, non-veterans will say, well, I really don't know what to say uh, other than thank you for your service. There are um, veterans and non-veterans alike that make up our team, and we could not do our job without them. Reintegration is not just bringing together an enclave of veterans. It's about building a team that reintegrates with the entire community. And we are blessed to have one of the most diverse and uh, widely uh, talented agencies in city government. Thank you. Um, I agree. It does not take a veteran to serve a veteran, but it takes a veteran to get a job. <laughs> so I just want to encourage that if we could fill the rest of the vacancies um, with the people that uh, served our country, and I know that's your number one priority. Absolutely. And if there's no law against it, let's do it. No, you that's know, what we I do. Don't, I don't see why not. Um, what we do. Thank you. Um, so the budget, uh, uh, DVS fiscal 2018 adopted budget was uh, for 4.4 million, uh, but the department has ended up spending uh, 3.6 million uh, by the end of the year. Uh, can you, uh, Commissioner, can you uh, please explain the, this underspending? Yeah, I would venture to, to say that a lot of the underspending is due to uh, PS accruals. So with a number of vacancies on the PS side, um, we're not spending money on those salaries. Uh, so that accrues and uh, would account for some of that underspending. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Do we have to? I think yeah, so let's, let, we have to sway you in. Sure. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, so yeah, the underspending could be accounted for uh, with the number of vacancies that we have on the PS side because we're not spending money on those salaries that accrues on the PS side. That would account for some of that underspending. In what areas in the budget did you spend, uh, did you spend less? Yeah, we, c we can do a breakdown. We can send you a breakdown of where we've underspent, uh, both on the PS side as well as the OTPS side, but we'll get some details together for you on that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, VetConnect uh, was launched on November 11th in, uh, of 2018, uh, yet there's still funding of 514000 in DVS budget and fiscal year 2010 for a contract uh, for VetConnect. Uh, is there still work being done on VetConnect? Yeah, absolutely. So when VetConnect launched on uh, uh, October 18th of this year and was announced by the mayor at the Veterans Day breakfast, um, the program had already been underway as a, as a pilot program in New York City. But with the formal launch, uh, we've been working very closely with uh, the team at the uh, Institute of Veteran and Military Families out of Syracuse in uh, better understanding how we can increase the number of referrals uh, through that platform, connecting it with more veterans across the city and finding ways that we can expand the network of service providers in the network itself. Uh, so that's something that uh, teams both at DVS and with our uh, partners are looking to expand. Okay, uh, wh uh, what types of uh, data do you expect to be able to collect? Uh, 
uh, from Gut Connect. Yes, yeah, so but we are we're currently working to build uh, pipelines to receive data from uh, the Gut Connect NYC platform to our team, where we can do some of that analysis. Um, but some of the things that we do know is the uh, who is calling. We learn a little bit about who they are and where they live in New York City. Uh, we learn a little bit about what service uh, era they served in in the military and, and what branch of service. Uh, and we also know what they're calling about. So uh, when a, a veteran calls the, the platform, they uh, ask for assistance. We record those sorts of things so we can gain a picture of what sorts of services are uh, in demand by veterans. Thank you. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's move on. We, um, I want to go into go a little bit into veteran suicide. Um, now, do we have a, a number of veterans that commit suicide annually here in New York City? Uh, to continue from the conversation of yes. the last hearing, Dr. Harrington and I are both working on this, and we've reached out to both the VA as well as to the epidemiology ex experts within DOHMH and the medical examiner's office, and we will be wor working to see what, what we can uh, uh, create in terms of a, um, an accurate number at the city level for veteran suicides. At this point, we do not have that, as we talked about last uh, hearing, but we are work actively working towards that end. So how is, how is uh, uh, DOHMH um, planning on collecting that data? You know, we'll we'll be able to lay it out for you once we've collected the the information and meet together, and then we'll put together a plan, a strategy, and we'll be glad to share that with you. Thank you. Uh, do you know? Do you have a number of how many uh, supportive housing uh, units there are for veterans in the city of New York, as well as um, uh, um, set asides where you have veterans living there? Do we have like a total number? You know, I don't have that right here. I know that Nicole Branca, our assistant commissioner and, and senior advisor, is here, and she recently talked to your office and gave all that information, but we'd be glad to give, uh, give a follow-up briefing with all of that information in it, Chair Deitch. Um, are the, um, the areas where they have supportive housing and, uh, and veteran housing, now, if a, a veteran uh, would commit suicide, and there's a suicide in one of those supportive housing facilities or affordable housing. Now, are those uh, suicides reported to anyone well, within, within the veterans community? That's why we need multiple data streams. So the VA will be able to help us out with veterans uh, who have died by suicide who are enrolled to the VA. Our medical examiner's office will be able to help us uh, sort out all suicides here in New York City, including, uh, what, you know, what we work with them all the time now in terms of uh, veteran deaths. Uh, when we have reason to believe that they might be a veteran, the medical examiner's office reaches out to us and we work with the VA to be able to validate that. So we've got you know, we've got a number of data sources that we need to bring together on this, and we'll let you know uh, what we come up with. But we understand and we recognize that this is a very important uh, set of data, and it's also one of the reasons why I think I mentioned last uh, uh, week that we are working with Dr. Kelly Posner from Columbia to be able to uh, widely train and disseminate the Columbia Protocol, which is the world's leading evidence-based tool to identify suicide risk and prevent suicides. So this is terribly important. I just spoke with Joe Hunt from Emotional Vibrant Health, uh, who's hosting a community-wide training. We've trained our team. We're going to be putting together a citywide strategy to really get this tool out there. So um, su the supportive housing providers, are they uh, required to report? Uh, if, there if there are any, any suicides within their facility? Are they required? For any death, there's going to be an investigation, so I, I, I'll need to... Uh, yes, because no, usually what happens is if there's a, if there's a suicide death, then 911 is called, they respond. I'll and, find out what, their, what but, their protocol is, but certainly for any death, uh, uh, there's a protocol that the city goes through to determine uh, cause of death and whether there yeah, was foul play. But there's nothing above that. Like if it's in a veteran's, um, if it's in a veteran's uh, uh, supportive housing, there's no other protocol than normal procedures um, when 
uh, if a veteran commits suicide. Is there any other protocol besides but, the normal protocols? Yeah, we'll, we'll need, this is one of the things that uh, Dr. Herring and Ted and I are, are researching, so we'll, we'll okay. let you know what we okay, find Okay, so, uh, yeah, because I, um, I spoke to, um, to Susan uh, from Thrive, and I want to bring in the first aid mental health into uh, the supportive housing mm -hmm. um, uh, facilities to bring mental health. So I just want to know, and I think it's important for us to know, if within those facilities, what the, um, you know, if or how many uh, veterans commit suicide, because we know the veteran suicide is uh, the highest amongst, you know, here in America, 20, 20 a day. This is and one of the important uh, sources of data, and that's yeah. why we're doing the research. Yeah, because it's just interesting, because I know that you did quite a few, um, Thrive has done quite a few um, mental health first aid trainings. So that information, I think they should have known already if they're doing this training by, you know, I think it's important for them to have the knowledge uh, before they do the training, just to know what they're dealing with uh, in the veterans community, especially in the supportive housing. Okay, uh, so I'm going to, I want to go to my colleagues because I don't want to keep uh, Paul here all night. So we'll go with Paul, Paul Valone. I'll say one other thing, Chair Deitch. On I was that, that close, Commissioner. I, <laughs> just one <laughs> moment, Council Member okay. Valone. But I completely agree with the critical importance of us getting our arms around accurate data in terms of completed suicides. I'm equally invested in getting to the left of that suicidal behavior, that desperate position, and being able to train our supportive housing workers as well as veteran residents in the use of both the Columbia Protocol and connection to resources through both our own outreach team as well as our housing and support veteran peer coordinators and Vet Connect NYC. So there's no one size fits all or one cookie cutter approach, but certainly to get a proven tool in the hands of those who can use it and save lives. That's, that's what this is, is geared towards. Thank you very much. And I, I don't think anything, um, I, you know, I, it's important working together, and that's what these hearings are for, just to bring some of these issues that we feel are lacking um, out to the hearing, and then let's work together to make sure that we get those numbers. We work with Thrive NYC. We bring those mental health first aid. Uh, and we have the same goals, and uh, let's Absolutely. And, you we'll know, work together to get Chair it done. Deitch, while we're talking about Thrive NYC, let me just say I would point to anyone who has seen some of the uh, latest concerns expressed. I would point you to an op-ed that uh, Commissioner Barbo uh, published in the Daily News yesterday that talks about the city's historic and pioneering investment in caring for the seriously mentally ill. It's it's well worth reading for any of us who are concerned about this vital area. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations on doubling the Council's initiative last year, uh, growing our, our involvement and engagement with our veterans. And Absolutely. good afternoon, Commissioner, to your team. Always good to see everyone out there. Thank you. Uh, you know us and you know me. I'm always trying to fight to get us more, more and more. So this time of year, it really is trying to take these preliminary budgets and telling whoever's deciding on the final numbers, we need more. So it is always our focus to bring more services. So that's where your tool in that process, and we want to help you in that process. Um, I see what your preliminary budget is here for us at 5.2 million uh, for the preliminary, and I look at our council budgets, and I have more than you. So <laughs> that's not good. We need you, if I'm dealing with just Northeast Queens and you're dealing with the whole city, we've got to get you more money. I would think that would be a good first step is to at least to try to double your, to your budget. The amount of veterans that are in New York City at this point, you say they're increasing, remaining the same, decreasing on an annual basis? So on an annual basis, um, because many of our veterans are at the middle or even approaching the end of life. You know, 13% of our veterans are World War II veterans, 11% uh, Korean War veterans, 29% Vietnam veterans. Many of them are experiencing the issues, including uh, uh, end of life, health issues, and death. Um, 
at the same time that we have a vibrant community of both Gulf War veterans as well as post 9-11 veterans who increasingly are coming back to New York City, both native New Yorkers as well as um, folks like me who didn't grow up anywhere close to New York City. I think that to the extent that we can continue to demonstrate our respect for veterans and our support for their continued service, we will continue to draw veterans back to New York City. But have you seen that number rise or remain but the, the same? The, but the number, the trend line at this point would be going down as is the national trend line for veterans. Because about 50% of them are our elder veterans from Korean War in the past. That is correct. You know, I wasn't even thinking of bringing that up, but since there is such a huge percentage of seniors in our elder population, yes. there's probably room for us to have a joint effort with DIFTA. Yes. Um, we also sit on, we just uh, yelled for more money for all of our seniors also, but I, I don't see any particular programs that DIFTA is working for veterans, and I'm wondering if that might be something we can tackle. So, <coughs> excuse me. Just last month, we had a three-hour session with the DIFTA team, and we are currently uh, folding uh, 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 folding the senior centers into our uh, strategy. We, we're in the midst of Deputy Commissioner Roth is leading a 90-day strategy task force for our new engagement and community services strategy, and we, we recognize absolutely DIFTA is part of that. Please reach out. We'd love to be part of that. Um, yes. We have transformed Thank you so much elder for law and for adult protective services and the needs for seniors from the simplest of forms of powers of attorney and health care proxy and elder law planning and aging, and lots of our veterans are on their own trying to prepare that. Yes. As we provide lawyers for everyone else, we better be providing lawyers for our veterans so that they can provide for themselves and their families. I think we have to do a lot more there, and I think that's There's no that doubt. That's something that we can start immediately. Thank the, you. The numbers that Chair Deutsch mentioned on the amount of veterans that we've reached, because the PMMR states there's 7,500 veterans and families in fiscal 2018. How, how do we get those numbers? So we have, in fact, I'll let Deputy Commissioner Ross describe. Uh, it's a it's, it's been an ongoing evolution, as you know, to develop our data systems. Uh, Jeff, you want to Yeah, elaborate? so the, the numbers on uh, the estimates for the number of veterans in New York City, part of it comes from the census. Uh, part of it also comes from, that would account for federal veterans. Uh, part of the numbers come from uh, the Department of Defense when we had uh, outreach with them on. Well, that's total number of veterans. Yeah. How do we know that? We, we can determine the total number of veterans through that, but how do we determine the veterans that are actually reached and serviced by DVS? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So through our outreach team, uh, anytime we interact with a, a veteran, we, uh, we count, account for that. Uh, so we call that an engagement. Um, that could be at uh, an event where we're providing information, uh, say, at a jobs fair or tabling. Is there also that same type of data from other agencies coming to you since you're not sometimes the original point of contact? That's correct. Uh, not yet, but that is something that we're, we're actively looking to build out. Uh, one key note is we just hired our very first uh, data and reporting uh, expert back in October. So this person's been on staff uh, and is building out that, that area for us. Uh, so both working with the data that we had internally and organically within the, or the agency, working out to sister agencies to find out what data they have related to veterans and how we can pull that into the agency to increase our understanding, uh, as well as the Vet Connect NYC piece and building pipelines there so we can uh, use that data in to inform our picture as well. Well, I mean, before you jump in, Commissioner, uh, sure. not knowing the amount of interagency action with veterans is disturbing because how do we have a number when you're the smallest agencies and our other agencies are dealing with veterans every day? I want you to have that information. That goes back to when the corrections didn't have files on the detainees and inmates at Rikers and so forth. That has to be, and I know Commis uh, Chair Deutsch has been calling for that, data and we have to have that for you to determine these budgets and determine going forward because clearly it's not just DVS dealing with a veteran, whether it's DIFTER, whether it's DOT, whether it's buildings, whether it's landlords. Um, there's, there's a 
numerous amounts of that going on. Uh, we need that data. Yeah, and if I could just say, you know, I think Local Law 23 was a great initial step, and I'm really happy to report that subsequently, led by uh, Council Member Chin, Local Law 127, which has we work with the Mayor's Office of Operations to ensure that the veteran self-identification question is on that, that citywide identification form, and that form you know, they, it's still in the pilot stage, but it's being used at DSS, ACS, DHS, Video. DOHMH, uh, DISTA, uh, as well as DYCD and DOE. So we are very eager to see what we can find out, what we can learn from our population. It is a self-identification uh, option, so it's not mandatory, but we are continuing to work, uh, you know, to help help our community understand. So for example, when there's a new case management file started mm -hmm. and DIFTA or any agency starts that file, one of the boxes that we force them to create is whether they are a veteran or not. Are you getting that information? So what we have, we, we up till this point, we have not had the capacity or the ability to get that information, it has not been on the form. This is now a new form that has come out just within the last few months, so it's in the early stage of adoption. That's going to be a huge task. You're going to need uh, just the amount of volume of those case matters that's going to come to you once this begins. is going to be not just data collection, but going through it and seeing what services they're actually applying for. It's going to double, at least double your staff. I, 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 I don't want to take up the, the, the chairs. My last question would be, I just want to fight for you to have that. Thank you. Um, and the other thing is, since Chair Deutsch managed to lobby to get doubling of the amount of the council initiatives, God bless you, the amount, how those contracts are awarded, how they're maintained and accounted for is not done through DVS. Is that something that we can try to change going forward? Would you rather manage those initiatives through DVS or would you rather keep them in the other agencies where they are now? Okay, at, at this point, Managing the 58 contracts, for example, that represent this fiscal year's investment by the City Council, uh, that is so far beyond our capacity um, at our stage of evolution, we, we could not possibly manage that load. However, they give you the accountability of how those programs are going? Do you get the updates? So account I just want to make sure you're still running that ship so the way glad, you want. I'm so glad you asked because um, the the individual that we're bringing on that we've been funded to hire to join Eric's team uh, with our advocacy and intergovernmental affairs, one of the roles will be the role of an ombudsman. That individual will be the go-between, tracking those contracts, working with the city agencies, working with the community-based organizations to make sure that there's no hiccups and that it goes as fast as possible. So These we are, are much needed employment uh, resumes that are going to be coming into your agency. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I also echo your concerns on the Mental Health Thrive Collaborative with uh, veterans because to this day, my district still does not have any participation, and we have one of the largest veterans populations. So much work needs to be done on that. Much work. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, um, regarding, uh, just to continue the conversation from Councilmember Vallone on the, on the data collection, uh, what type of data does DVS collect or obtain regard, uh, regard um, veterans' demographics? I'm sorry? Regarding veterans' demographics throughout New York City, like, uh, what type of, like, what do you do? How do you collect all the data? Yeah, so what we can do is we've just recently redesigned our intake forms. We'd be glad to share that with you, but it collects a variety of data in terms of era of service and, of course, uh, gender and uh, particular need. And uh, uh, we, we work very closely with uh, vet ve veterans, whether they come to us by a walk-in or a call-in, and we have a standard data uh, intake form now that collects a variety of demographic information. We'd be glad to share that with you. So does it, it gets entered into a, a system, a software? So how does that work? How many people do you have that collects the data, like in the office within DVS? Like when information comes in from the peer counselors, right? The peer counselors go out in all five boroughs, and I'm sure they have to bring back information, right? 
And then it comes back into the office, uh, to DVS, and then how does, what is the process? How does it work? Yeah, so the, the, the outreach specialists, they enter their uh, workload into the CRM, and then uh, Pedro Zapata, who is here, he's the individual that uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, who's come on board to do our data and reporting. He then works with our team to make sure that that data is clean, that it can be accurately reported, and then as Jeff mentioned earlier, we're working with IBMF uh, to ensure that the Vet Connect NYC data comes forward as well. So it's a, it's a uh, complex process, but we are excited to be in a position where in real time, and this gets back to your point, uh, 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 Council Member Vallone, uh, with Vet Connect NYC, we're in a position with the advanced tech platform that we can monitor real-time usage of resources, care, and services, and then we're in a position to be able to advocate when there are clear shortages or when things are not going in the direction that uh, had been initially anticipated. So I understand, why, why is it a complex process? I'm just trying to understand. Like, why is the data, receiving the data and putting it into, um, and to entering it into your, your statistics in regards to different categories. Mm -hmm. Like, why is that complex? I mean, I, I'm just, like, I'll give you an example. In my office, when, when people call in or they walk in or we go out to events, everything gets logged in by categories. So everything is done the same day. The same, by the time when 5 o'clock rolls around, we're done. Everything is in the system. And if I, like I mentioned at the Thrive, at the, at the, um, mental health uh, committee, that I could call my office now and within five minutes I could get exact data of every walk-in, call, uh, event that we have, participants, everything is computer, everything's entered into, co into a computer, into a data, and I could get that information within five minutes, I could give you a breakdown by category. So when you say it's complex, like, I, I'm just wondering what why What is complex, is Chair, is to develop a data su system from scratch. No, so that, that's so what I'm trying to understand. What, it, what, what that entails then, you know, you have five square miles in your district. That's great that you have a, an evolved system that you're able to, to provide that kind of real-time data. That's where we're working towards, and I will tell you that the strides that we have made just in these last few months getting the, our personnel uh, on board, cross-training our team, and making sure that the data that we enter is clean data. There always has to be a cross-check. There has to be a process. There has to be, first of all, a, 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 an infrastructure platform to even collect the data. So, for example, for our CRM, uh, we started collecting data in July of 2017, brought on board the first phase of our CRM. We're now in the process of working with the CRM contractor so that we can customize it so that it fits the way in which we actually work. So it's a process. It is not a lock key uh, moment in time. So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to figure it out. It's like, for example, when I got elected in 2000, I'm, Commissioner, I'm having a conversation. I'm not. I'm just, this is an open conversation. It just happens to be at a hearing, an oversight hearing, because that's a committee. But I represent 190,000, uh, approximately 190,000 people in my district, right? You have 210,000 veterans, right? So I have almost the same amount of constituents mm -hmm. as DVS has, and we have veterans here in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And when I got elected from day one, I had the system up and running That's from day one. Um, so I, I can, like, if, if a constituent walks into me and says I need services and I respond to the constituents, you have to give me six months or a year to get my foundation put in, get up and running. They're not going to vote for me again. I'm out of office in 2017. So I, I built my foundation on day one just to make sure that I have the data. I'm not talking about everything. I'm not talking about everything else that goes on in the veteran community. I'm talking about just having that data and having that stats. So maybe someone needs to look at how your system works at DVS and how to better streamline that system and how to better get the information 
uh, from the peer counselors, from advocates, yeah. from providers, and bring that information in. Because once the system is in place, then you're done. Everything, everything runs automatic and, and it runs well. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to come here and just to say, oh, you know, and, and to complain. I want to work together with DVS. I would, you know, work with you, the commissioner, and your staff to make sure that we're able to work together and whatever resources, city resources you need, we'll help you out. We have no problem. We'll help out your staff at DVS to make sure that we're up and running this way. We don't go from one hearing to the next and go back and forth regarding certain stats and certain issues that are going on. We could do a lot of stuff offline. We don't have to do everything at a hearing. We could do a lot of stuff offline. And let's get, let's get it up and running. This way, it's a well-oiled machine. Well, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. I'm happy to sit down with you offline as well, Chair. You know, the internal data, first we had to develop the infrastructure and the system and the reporting channels. Now we, we have that in place. Getting the external data is a little more challenging, but we're working that. But for example, in our most established line of action, our, depart our uh, housing and support services, you know, w w we have real-time data on those numbers every single day, and that's where we're working towards. There's no daylight between your, uh, uh, the value you place on data and the value that we place on data. In, for, in fact, since this uh, hearing began, uh, Assistant Commissioner Brank has just informed me that we've had two moves since the hearing be began. So this is where we're moving towards. Happy to lay it down for you in terms of what the roadmap is and where we're projected to go, but we're so excited because just a, as as, Chair, as, as uh, Council Member Vallone knows, just a very short time ago, we didn't have really anything that we could point to in terms of data. So it is a work in progress, and, and uh, nobody's more impatient about this than I am, Chair Deitch, and I'm happy to share with you the details because we're very proud of the progress we've made, but we also know we've still got a long ways to go, and we're on that journey. And I, I'm willing to help you with that, with that process. So I just want to say regarding the housing, um, when I did my research about six months ago, there were about, I think, 28 units that were unoccupied mm -hmm. uh, veteran for veterans, mm -hmm. specifically for veterans. So I did send uh, an email and a meeting with DVS asking about the 28 uh, empty vacant apartments that need to go to, uh, the, that are meant for veterans. So when the numbers, when you have that tracking, when you have those numbers, on, in that phone conversation, the response should have been, oh, of course, 28 vacant apartments. Uh, this is why it's vacant. And, and you start giving the reasons why, but they should know why those apartments, 28 apartments, were vacant. I received a, a response about a, a month later, right? and in the, Within that month, I didn't get any type of correspondence of why they were vacant, and then DVS had to look in to see exactly why they were vacant. But what I'm trying to say is it doesn't need to be a request for me to figure out why and ask, and ask a question, why are these apartments empty? And if I do ask, the response should be, and if anyone asks, you know, the response should be, oh, we have that, we know that, we have data, these are the reasons and everything. But it did take a month before I received a response uh, why these apartments are vacant because they really had to look into it and make phone calls and see why it's vacant and see which ones are vacant. Those numbers should be in already. Those numbers should be at the fingertips of DVS. And this is what I'm talking about. That I'm sure you have statistics, but there is a lot more that we need to do because when I went to visit the supportive housing and they told me there's a vacancy and I asked them why is this apartment vacant they said the, that uh, the veteran just passed away, and uh, it was um, the NYPD came down and sealed the apartment. So, and it takes like three, four weeks before it gets unsealed. The detective needs to come down and to unseal it. Sometimes they take this sweet time. So I brought this up with the police commissioner, and I, I asked him, please, if it's one of the veterans' um, housing, 
please make sure and send out a memo to the detectives that they should reopen that apartment as soon as they can, and there should not be any gap of services because there are too many veterans, even one, there are too many veterans waiting for housing, and why should they be homeless and be in a shelter for more than one second if they could find themselves um, supportive housing or permanent housing? So this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the data that if tomorrow, if I find out that there are a few vacancies uh, at one of the um, veteran housing, and I call up DVS, the question is, am I going to get the response right? Do, does DVS have all this data? Like, maybe now they have it, but I did bring it up about six months ago, and it took a month before I got a response of why they were vacant. Yeah, so, so certainly we would not want a month to go by. That's an unacceptable delay, so I apologize for that delay. But I, what I can tell you is that we will always work to make sure that whatever data we share, that it's accurate, that it's up to date, that, it's, that we're uh, inclusive. We're working right now with HRA uh, to create more frequent uh, data reporting cycles. You know, our team of five veteran peer coordinators is responsible, uh, you know, it's about 5% of the uh, workforce across the city that's working to house veterans, and they punch well above their weight, um, but we don't have uh, direct visibility in real time over the entire stock. But we are working towards that end because we know that responsivity uh, we're as anxious as you are to get, if there's a, an empty apartment to be had that a veteran can get out of shelter and move into, we're as anxious as you are to make sure that that happens. So we will uh, continue to work with you and uh, work with you and provide timely information as you requested. Thank you. The, uh, doesn't HRA have a veteran, a veteran liaison? HRA has, in fact, they've just recently hired an additional uh, veteran outreach specialist, but uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Branca works with HRA, works with DHS. I mean, we've got contacts throughout the agencies across the city, HPD, NYCHA. Uh, we've got numerous contacts across the city, depending upon what kind of information it is that we need. So why isn't it that those liaisons who work for HRA, who work for NYCHA, shouldn't they be responsible to report this information to DVS? And if yes, why aren't they doing it? And if they're not doing it, why are they still a veteran, a veteran liaison? So the veteran, the agency veteran liaisons, yes, now I'm tracking with you, yes. Each agency has a veteran liaison, and that individual is a point of contact when we have a veteran or somebody that we're working with who, who has an issue that's pertaining to that agency, then we work with them and we collaborate to find a solution. But that's, a, that's, that's apart from the, uh, the data work that we do with agency to agency to be able to uh, keep track of and to collaborate on ensuring accuracy to data and the timeliness of reporting. Do those veteran liaisons, is that what they do all day being a veteran liaison, or they do other work and they may just work on veteran issues five minutes a day? Well, it depends upon the, the day, but they are, th that is not their full-time job. So that why, so that's, so we need to hold, you know, a, a veteran when they, when a person in the military fights for our country, mm -hmm. it's a full-time job, right? When they're a veteran, they're a veteran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when HRA has a veteran liaison or NYCHA has a veteran liaison, maybe this is where we have to look to fund to have, to make sure that we have a full-time veteran liaison uh, for HRA and for NYCHA. So this way we have real-time information that, God forbid, if a veteran commits suicide at 2 o'clock in the morning, that person would be responsible to report it to DVS. If there's a vacant apartment, right, that veteran liaison should be reporting that to DVS, and then it goes into your unit. So I think that this is 
part of the problem um, that HRA and NYCHA does not have a full-time veteran liaison who focuses on veterans 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and reports this information because if their job is only to work on veteran issues for maybe five minutes a day, then that's really nothing, and it's, it's not fair for our veterans. So I'd like to ask you, Commissioner, to advocate with me and maybe to do a joint letter to the mayor um, that to hold the administration accountable that outside of DVS, they should have a full-time veteran liaison. You know, let's, let's, let's talk about that, Chair Deitch. I think we share the same concern and passion for veterans. I won't commit to a letter at this point, but I would definitely like to yeah, so continue I mean, the conversation. Uh, my staff is listening to the hearing right now, and I could tell you that I could almost guarantee you that a letter is being drafted right now as, as, um, as they watch this hearing. And I really have nothing to think about, honestly. You, you're probably, your hands are tied as a commissioner working for the mayor, but my hands are not tied. And um, I, want, I want to make sure that we have a veteran liaison. I don't think any person, whether a veteran or non-veteran, will say no and agree that we should have a 24-hour veteran full-time position who will advocate for our veterans. So when there is a vacant apartment, for example, that is reported right away. And if it's not reported, then that veteran liaison right now who doesn't work on veteran issues and is not reporting veteran issues properly, maybe he or she should sleep in the veteran shelter and have the veteran move into his apartment. Um, we need to hold those veteran liaisons fully, fully accountable. Uh, when, I go to, when I go home, I sleep on my phone, it's next to my bed, I'm a council member 24 hours a day. Okay, seven days a week. I have the Sabbath, my phone is still next to me, when an emergency comes in, I must respond. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the council 24-7. So I think that someone who's going to be a veteran liaison needs to be available, needs to report to DVS. I'm not asking for 24 hours a day, but it should definitely not be five minutes a day. And information needs to be reported, not needs to be, it must be reported in real time. So that is part of the lack of communication when it comes to a few points, whether it's um, a veteran who may have PTSD in housing that is not being reported to DBS or to the proper channels because his and her job is not full-time. Or maybe it's a housing issue or a vacancy issue or any, any other type of issues that have to do with these agencies that they know about or they may not know about because they're not focused on this. You know, Chair Deitch, what I will commit to is, is let's let's have a round table. Let's bring the the uh, the stakeholders around the table and let's let's talk this through. But I, I I think that would be an important next step. But I'd be glad to participate in such a such a round table. Who would be the stakeholders on this? Let's. What I'd like to do is I'd like to consult with uh, Assistant Commissioner Branca, and we'll work with your office and and uh, propose what might be a good uh, grouping to continue this conversation. So the only, the only issue I have is that um, as elected officials, the lack of response and timely response from the administration is a problem. I, I just put in the bill the other day in the city council, it's being drafted now, that would require New York City to have a task force a task force to visit every single city agency and check the efficiency, check the response time, check the money waste, and check how they operate, making sure they have the right uh, datas and computers and softwares and um, the staff members have their jobs that they have titles for that they are using those titles for what they, what they need to do, and then put together a 
plan of how to correct it, not just report it, but they should also correct it by bringing, bringing in resources, bringing in advisors, and to revamp that agency to make sure that New York City, 8.6 million New Yorkers, 210,000 veterans, and receive not only the services that everyone deserves, I'm not just talking about veterans, I'm talking about all the agencies, but it should be done in a timely manner, in a responsive manner, and just to move things. This is a city that we call that never sleeps. And whenever we go back and forth with administration on one issue, one of many, then we're just being pushed back. We're being pushed back. It took, takes me sometimes and others two or three years to accomplish one thing, one of many things that we have to fight for because of lack of communication and sometimes the agencies are busy, oh, we're busy with something else, but we'll get to your thing soon. It's all equally important, and we need to make sure that the agencies work with efficiency. So when it comes to sitting down with stakeholders, I could bet you right now, Commissioner, and everyone here, that this meeting will not happen this week, because if we're serious about this, it should happen tomorrow, and it should get done quick, the conversation should get done quick. Not two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, six months, a year. We're going to be sitting here in 2020, maybe discussing the same issues. We need to get things done. We need to see action. And that is what this committee is about, to have oversight to make sure that things are run properly. Um, Commissioner, I think you're doing a great job. And I want to work with you because I think sometimes I think there's a lot of loopholes here that we need to correct, and this is one of many, for example, and we need to, we should get this done. So if um, if you if you could set up the meeting with the administration, I would that would be great, and um, I could report back and to see what transpired from the stakeholders meeting. I think that no one would not agree with me saying that we need to have a full-time position in all these agencies uh, who, who are um, advocating, supposed to be advocating for the veterans and to report everything in real time. Uh, in addition to that, um, so that, that would take care of the operations parts and the data parts of, of DBS. In addition to that, then you have the media part, because a lot of resources that are there has to do with reaching out to people and making sure people understand that these are the services the veteran has. We need to make it as easy as possible for a veteran to reach out to DVS to receive those services. How does your, um, how do you work with, when it comes to media, Commissioner, when it comes to getting the message out reaching out to as many veterans as possible. Do you have a database of emails, phone numbers, addresses? How does, how does the outreach work? Absolutely. We're uh, pleased to have uh, two full-time communication staff. When I think I mentioned earlier in my testimony that we've got a digital, digital manager that we are currently uh, preparing to bring on board to make this a three-member team. Uh, we, the communications team organizes our high-level speaking events. They connect with constituents at the commissioner, deputy commissioner level at speaking events in all five boroughs, including community discussions, keynote speeches, mayoral events. Also, they regularly uh, engage with local reporters, generating coverage about DVS in print media, television, news broadcast, and digital media outlets. I mentioned the podcast. Which let's see, you go, let's see, let's see, one second. Let's, I want someone to do a look a little slowly because my head's spinning because you're doing a lot over there. Um, so let's talk about just, I'm sorry, I'm not cutting you off. I'm just, I just want to go one by one or maybe like three at a time. So your communication staff goes to all five boroughs. Is that different than the peer counselors? So that's addition to the peer counselors, right? That is an okay. addition. So you have you have five peer councils. Is are all five spa, uh, slots uh, all five spots taken? Are they occupied? Are they? Um, do you have a peer council currently in all five boroughs? Our veteran peer counselors work with our housing and support services team, 
and they lead the, the veteran homelessness mission. Our engagement and community services specialist, they're the team that we have merged over these last six months and are currently cross-training and preparing uh, for a, a, um, uh, a citywide strategy that combines both the whole health as well as education and employment and veteran benefit uh, counseling uh, capability, and that is the team that we currently have two uh, openings that are posted. Okay, so and so now you have, do you have a peer counselor now in every borough? Is that job taken? The veteran peer counselors, yeah. uh, they work wherever they need to. They I'm saying is, is the, you have, you have a title of, of a peer counselor for each borough, right? So you have five peer counselors? Okay. Perhaps it would, would make more sense, Chair, if we sit down, we can lay this out for you because it's, it can be a little confusing. The veteran peer coordinators, they go where the homeless veterans are and where the housing stock is, which is in all five boroughs. But our other, our ECS, the, the Engagement and Community Service Coordinators, they're the specialist who uh, man the veteran resource centers, which are located one in each borough and they're also the ones who do all of the community outreach um, for all issues other than homelessness across the city. So you have an office in each borough, right, for the peer coordinator? For the, for the engagement and community services uh, specialist. The, the, the veteran peer coordinators, they work at, in a number of places, as do our ECS specialists, but they work in the shelters, they work with landlords, they work in apartments, they, they work all over the city. And I mentioned that we're in the midst of uh, a 90-day uh, strategy uh, task force that will prepare our engagement and community services specialists that are a new and improved outreach team that mans our, our veteran resource centers, one in each borough. Okay, so you have a satellite office in each borough. Correct. So it's and each one is staffed by one, one person, right? Are all those five positions taken? So we currently have two positions that are open. They're okay, so posted. which which borough is that? No, we cover all of the boroughs. No, we we are covering all of the boroughs with our team as it stands. We are no. also hiring two additional individuals, but we are covering all of the veteran resource satellite office hours in each borough today. So you have someone in each? Yes. In each borough. And that's, it's staying that way? The same person that's there now is staying at the satellite office or you're moving around or you're gonna be switching it around? You know, it, it varies. I mean, right now we, we, we have a reduced number of specialists, so they're having to double team, but they, work together and, and, and collaborate across uh, borough lines. So they're covering the bases, but we also look forward to bringing on board the two additional specialists which are currently uh, posted. So I, I just don't understand something. So in each, in each borough you have a satellite office, right? Mm -hmm. So you always have someone at the satellite office. No. We don't have someone there full time. We have posted part, office yeah, part hours. Yeah, posted office hours. You have someone there for the posted office hours. So why, why isn't that person who's there for the posted office hours, why isn't that the same person every day so that, you, that person could understand that community, sure. know what meetings to go to, uh, community board meetings, priest and council meetings, Absolutely. civic meetings. So, so why is it being? Why are people being moved around? Then we have we have two vacant positions right now, Chair Dyke. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. So what we do is we we work to preserve continuity, just for the reasons that you mentioned. But when we have two empty positions, we have to cover. Uh, all five boroughs with a reduced number of folks, but as soon as we get those positions filled, then we will have consistency and continuity on a per borough basis, and we look forward to that. Are the, are the hours, like how does, how does everything, all five get covered for the posted hours when it's more or less the same hours? Yeah, sense? so the hours are posted on our website, and individuals can walk in. Uh, they can also call our front desk and uh, we then coord coordinate to make sure that every veteran who reaches out and wants to get assistance gets that assistance. 
No, my question, my question is uh, that if you have, let's say, posted hours, let's say from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at each site in all five boroughs, and you have three people that are covering five boroughs, right? So if they're all have the same hours, how is it possible for so all five to be covered? No, it's not Monday through Friday. So on average, uh, our satellite offices have posted hours for 10 to 12 hours a week and a total number of 20 hours uh, doing community outreach in the borough that include the satellite hours. So they're, they're staggered throughout the week. It's, it's not every day of the week. And so um, uh, we'll, we'll be able to send you the, the lay down on this if you want. Uh, a more detailed look, but yeah. we are absolutely committed to ensuring that our veterans do not have to cross a river or a bridge to get the help that they have earned. So what are the Brooklyn hours and what days are the Brooklyn hours? Do you, does anyone have that information? Sure. So the Brooklyn hours, uh, this is at the Workforce One Center at 9 Bond Street, and it's uh, Monday and Wednesday. 10 to 12, and is it 1 to 3? With the R word being held over the companies by our electric... 10 to 12 and 1 to 4. And, and Wednesday is also 10 to 12? Pardon me? Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m.? Monday and Wednesdays from 10 to noon and from 1 to 4 p.m. Oh, okay, Brooklyn. from 1 to 4. And then um, Manhattan? In Manhattan, uh, we've got uh, Monday and Friday, 10 to noon, 1 to 4 p.m. And Staten Island? So we'll, we'll put a matrix together for you, Chair Deitch. We'll be happy to do no, this. You don't, come here, yeah, maybe your staff could just, just read off the, the morning hours. I just want to know. OK, so, so 10, to, 10 to 12. I mean, we can just give. Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll just give you this this uh, okay. handout that has all of the hours. Uh, okay, great. Okay. Yeah, That's and great. then you'll have it for yeah. all five of the boroughs. Yeah, so uh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Pretty I didn't good. know you have something printed. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And that's Commissioner. something that we hand out regularly throughout the the city at our community outreach events and in the offices as well as the resource centers. starting to go into the classrooms here in New York, whether we like it or not, censorship won't work. We have to teach, empower, and elevate okay. our kids to um, the Okay, so I think, uh, I think we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap up for today, and we're gonna hear testimony from some of the advocates. So, Commissioner, thanks you once again. I'd like to thank you for being here, and we started late today. Um, we have a new room. Usually it's in the 16th floor, 250 Broadway. Um, maybe we we'll get a larger crowd. We'll go into the chambers <laughs> next time. <laughs> Look at the big time, aren't you? I, I just want to, I want to thank you, Commissioner, for being here today, and also for being very extremely responsive in the previous hearings. And I'm looking forward to working with you, Commissioner, and your team, um, to making sure that we streamline and get the, the veterans the services and resources, uh, and the knowledge. That we shall have the knowledge of what's going on throughout the city and regarding different services that, the, that, they are, that there are there for veterans. And I'm also looking forward to the mental health first aid trainings mm -hmm. that uh, we're setting up with, um, with Drive NYC. Terrific. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Dyke. And they are heard and they do result in action in different ways. And it's very important for us to know, well, especially several of the incidents that took place in Staten Island involved young people of the perpetrators. So we certainly want to see that we that this should be at least monitored and controlled to the extent that it can, and the results will have an effect na nas internationally, nationally, and also very locally. And I want to thank the council member and the ca Captain Beagle for first time for being on top of this issue. And I know that local law enforcement also, uh, the New York Poli uh, Police Department and the DA's office are also very aware of the relevance of what goes on online. Uh, for our first panel, uh, first of all, I want to thank all the advocates for being here today. Um, I s first panel, Maria Hunter, Coco, uh, Kathy Kramer, and uh, Deo Sun.
Morning, all of us, because um, we love him so much. And uh, this issue, as uh, Rabbi just said, is not a Jewish Happy. issue, it's not a Muslim issue, it's not a Haitian issue, Pakistani issue, it's a human being issue. If we see what is happening in our community, this is coming in time, but all of us, we are affected. And it is our moral responsibility to come together, to work together, and to stop this type of behavior. And we owe that to our children, to the next generation. The United States and New York City, New York City should be, as I said before. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go clockwise. Um, so we're, gonna, we're putting everyone on a three-minute clock, so you don't have to get into your whole testimony if it's more than that. So um, just try to get to the main points and, and try to stick to the three minutes, please. So we'll go clockwise, we'll talk, we'll start with Coco. So many people coming from everywhere and we will be a powerful country, a powerful Good afternoon, I'm Coco Colhane. I'm the founder and director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. Um, usually when we appear and testify, we're talking about a bill or some pressing issue. So I thought I would actually uh, take some time to tell you what we do, <laughs> aside from that. Um, so we do general legal services and specialize in veterans law. Um, and I'm going to just tell you about some of our initiatives. So we are partnered with the Jericho Project and Services for the Underserved. And we work with them on a supportive services for veterans families grant focusing on um, legal representation for housing and wraparound services to um, promote housing stability. We also have two medical legal partnerships with a number of sites with two entities. So one is with the Department of Veterans Affairs and we're in three vet centers once a week. Um, and that they are in the Bronx, Brooklyn and Queens. Um, we also partner with their counselors and uh, they provide medical evidence for our cases for our clients so that our attorneys are working closely with the counselors there. And then, uh, as you know, our other medical legal partnership is with the Community Healthcare Network and um, they will be speaking about that. But we are so fortunate because we can provide this resource to our clients who may not be eligible or some of the older vets in particular don't want to use the VA. Um, and CHN has pediatrics, women's care, all, everything that our clients and their families need. So that's been a great resource. Um, and then uh, what else? We just launched um, a justice involved outreach and we're working with the VA's Veterans Justice Outreach Office and we're going to uh, treatment courts and to four different units at Rikers and working on doing some preventative. We see a lot of vets who get um, massive overpayments because they didn't know that they were supposed to report their incarceration to the VA or they didn't know that they could actually have those benefits apportioned to their family while they're uh, in jail. And um, so we were seeing spouses, you know, being evicted and, and all sorts of hardships. So we thought if we could address this upstream and actually do the outreach and, and help veterans on that side. Um, and then our latest initiative, um, you know, we, it wouldn't be exact testimony unless I brought up less than honorable discharges. Um, and so, you know, we had done one outreach, one flyer back in August of 2013, and we've never done any other outreach. I mean, we speak and inform people about it. Um, but what's been really weighing on all of us is that there are a lot of LGBTQ veterans who are, you know, getting older and are going to lose their chance to actually correct the record to get their discharge upgrade. So um, we are going to, we're seeking support to uh, fund that and expand it, and we're going to partnering with Sage Vets and and hopefully addressing that issue. So. And then we have our discharge upgrade clinic with the pro bono partners, and I talk about that all the time. So, thank um, you very much. Uh, we are going to have like a round table before the budget. Um, so, and I just, if I could add one thing. Well, if you stop now, you get a, you get an extra snack when you come to my office. If you want to continue, you're not getting that candy. I got all right. I'm going to give up the snack because I think this is really important. I just I want to say that. I really think the Veterans Initiative should be prioritizing veterans' law. Um, you know, 
housing is crucial. There's nothing more, right, like housing court representation is absolutely vital, but there are massive funds in the city for general legal services and veterans need those services and use them. This is the chance to, you know, there's, there's just not enough lawyers doing veterans law, so we hope that you will prioritize that. Thank Understood. you. Understood, yeah. We're no gonna snack. see if we could uh, raise those initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. Good afternoon, my name is Dal Sun. I am a senior staff attorney with the Veterans Justice Project at Manhattan Legal Services, which is part of Legal Services NYC. Um, legal Services NYC is one of the largest providers of free civil legal services in the nation with offices in all five boroughs. We serve over 100,000 New Yorkers annually. Disney created DJP to help low-income veterans active duty service members and their family members to navigate the complex world of housing law, public benefits, family law, consumer law, social security, and other essential needs. Many low-income veterans face civil legal problems cannot afford an attorney, yet they are at a severe disadvantage without one. Our work, work our project works to ensure that veterans receive the benefit of free legal Council while tackling complicated civil legal matters. The Lisney's Veterans Justice Project helps more than 13,000 New York veterans and their family members annually. We do this by creating numerous access points and partnerships through which veterans can learn about our, about our services and receive our services. We have established and operate a citywide veterans hotline we created numerous legal clinics throughout the city to train pro bono attorneys to assist vet veterans. We no. operate several intake sites, no. creating and maintaining a veterans justice clinic at New York Law School, forging new partnerships and receiving referrals from more than 42 public and non-for-profit organizations that serve veterans. One of one example of the work that we do is that we assisted an elderly disabled veteran who was denied social security benefits in 2013 when he did not have an attorney. This veteran, 62 years old, suffers from a multitude of impairments, including PTSD and cancer. We, in 2015, we helped, we helped him complete another application for social security benefits the initial application was denied, and then we represented him at the administrative hearing. His application was finally approved in 2018, and he now he has an additional $1,200 a month in Social Security benefits, and he was awarded retroactive benefits of $52,000. So this makes a tremendous difference in this disabled veteran's life. Our veterans should not have to face a rationing of free civil legal services. They have sacrificed for all of us. We have a duty to ensure that veteran services, that veterans receive the benefits that they deserve and they have free and safe and affordable housing. Thank you. If you want to wave your snack, you could continue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Here you go. Chair Joyce, council members and staff, is your mic, your mic, I think, you turn on your mic, push the button, yeah. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Veterans Committee about the fiscal year 20 budget. My name is Maria Hunter and I'm the Director of Public Benefits at the New York Legal Assistance Group. I'm also joined by my colleague Ryan Foley who is the coordinating attorney of the Veterans Practice. The New York Legal Assistance Group uses the power of the law to help New Yorkers in need combat social and economic justice. Um, for veterans who seek to increase their veterans' benefits, having an attorney is crucial. Um, eligibility for different benefits varies and is predicated on a variety of factors. And the VA requires that anyone who helps, who aids in preparing, submitting, and appealing a VA benefit claim be accredited by the VA. The 2017 annual report of the Better Board of Veterans' Appeals, BVA, shows appeals brought by attorneys had a success rate that was 10% higher 
than those um, than all other representatives and advocacy groups combined on average. In fiscal year 17, some 81% of appeal claims with attorneys were either approved or remanded, and claim appeals with attorneys also had the lowest denial rate at only 14%. Even the federal courts acknowledge the difference when veterans are represented by counsel. Moreover, VA statistics show that a veteran's best chance at winning on appeal is to have a, an attorney as his or her representative. Attorneys are accustomed to analyzing complex laws and regulations, understanding complicated policies, and navigating the various bureaucracies that are keeping their clients from obtaining the, the benefits they need. NILAC serves hundreds of New York City veterans each year through its medical legal partnerships at the Bronx and Manhattan VA and through its community-based veterans practice, which is funded by the City Council's Legal Services for Veterans Initiative. NILAC aims to provide comprehensive services and we have served more than 350 veterans through the Legal Services for Veterans Initiative in just the first eight months of the current fiscal year. While many veterans come to us to assist in obtaining the benefits to which their service entitles them, we often find through our screening process that they have additional legal needs, such as housing, consumer debt, and advanced planning. The NILAC Veterans Practice provides assistance with all these areas of law, and is also able to refer to other matters in areas such as immigration and family law to attorneys within NILAG. The ability to fully serve clients in-house is especially crucial for veterans who often suffer from mental health issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder, which can be exacerbated when they are asked to tell their stories to multiple organizations, uh, who, and that may deter them from seeking out other services that they need. Thank you. I have a question. So when someone, when a veteran comes in, um, a veteran that has PTSD, so do they come in with like a doctor's um, clinical report or they come inside and they tell you that, oh, I have PTSD? Like how does that work? So there's a couple different ways that veterans come to us. If they're calling our main line, sometimes they're just calling us to find out, well, what am I eligible for? or um, so we, we screen them, and when we are talking about service-connected disability, we would talk about the conditions that uh, are causing their disability, and that might lead us to discuss their PTSD. But then we would help them um, obtain that medical documentation. We would reach out to their providers, we would gather VA records, so it, that can be an investigative process. Sometimes the clients come to us because they're already seeking treatment, um, and they might have been referred by their social worker at the hospital, for example. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Kramer, and I'm the CEO of Legal Information for Families Today, which is known as Lyft, but we're not the car service. Uh, Lyft was launched in 1996 when three wi women law students had the simple but revolutionary idea of establishing a go-to location in New York City family courts that would provide on-the-spot legal help for unrepresented parents struggling to make their way through the courts on civil legal issues. These issues were typically related to child support, custody, visitation, domestic violence, and guardianship. Today, we now serve over 30,000 families a year, and we have the following core programs. We have education and Im information sites in all the five family courts throughout the city, where we distribute um, one of our 38 original multilingual legal resource guides that cover a wide range of family law issues on a fifth grade reading level. We have family law information helplines, which are, are accessible by telephone, email, and live chat, and we receive approximately 14,000 calls a year. We have court consultations in the family courts where we provide in-depth consultation and it un enable unrepresented litigants to meet privately with a staff attorney and receive vital legal advice and counsel. And then we have a legal education and outreach program where we provide um, education workshops on family law and legal clinics out in the community where um, litigants don't have to come to court, but we meet them where they live. Thanks to funding um, by Councilmember Deutsch and the New York City Council in 2019, we are now able to target our legal resource 
information resources, and limited scope representation services to both active military and returning veteran parents in New York City. We're in the process of creating two new legal resource guides, our easy to read multilingual guides, one for active military members and one for returning veterans who are transitioning out of the military. These guides will cover a variety of issues relevant to active duty military and those transitioning, such as how can uh, veterans navigate the military child support requirements and then transition to the civil child support requirements when they come home? How can they do make child support modifications based on their change of employment when they're no longer in the military? How does custody and visitation modifications based on change of living circumstances work? How do VA benefits intersect with child support payments? What's the intersection between retirement benefits from the military and child support ca um, calculations? We're working with a number of veterans groups to ensure that we address the most pertinent issues in our guides. These include the New York City Bar Veterans Assistant Project, American Corporate Partners. And once our guides are finished in May, we hope to disseminate them in consultation with these partners out in the community so we can get the word out as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you so much for your support, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, uh, thank you for coming down and testifying. You could, you, could, you could stay all day if you want. <laughs> well, it's already the end of the day. Uh, our next panel, uh, Kelly Sabatino, Samuel, come on down, uh, Kathleen Stryhill, and James Hendon. Sorry, I missed the meeting. We'll go clockwise. Clockwise, yes, you go first. We're together, so yeah, we're, we're together. together. We're like, do so you want to switch? Oh, okay. You want to talk in the same time? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah. You have the same speech? Okay. All right. So we'll go this way. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Chairper Chairperson Deitch and members of the Committee on Veterans for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Kelly Sabatino, and I'm the Public Policy Manager at Community Healthcare Network, also known as CHN. CHN is a network of 14 federally qualified health centers, including two, two school-based health centers and a fleet of medical mobile vans. We provide affordable primary care, behavioral health, dental, and supportive services to 85,000 New Yorkers annually throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. As part of our mission to meet the needs of all New Yorkers, CHN launched the Military Health and Wellness Family Program in 2017 to provide comprehensive health and social services to military populations throughout New York City. The program directly helps meet the need for timely, culturally informed, and integrated health care among active duty service members, veterans, and military-affiliated family members, regardless of military discharge status. Since July 2017, we've engaged over 500 military-affiliated affiliated patients both inside and outside this program. Through a medical legal partnership with the Urban Justice Center's Veteran Advocacy Project, or also known as VAP, CHN offers primary and behavioral health care and legal and social services to military populations. Individuals referred to the program through VAP, VetConnect NYC, numerous veterans assistant organizations or internal staff are paired with a member of our social work team, screened using an intake form specially designed for military affiliated populations and provided with the care that they need. Launched in 2017 with an integrative grant from the New York Community Trust, both CHN and VAP were able to substantially expand the program in 2018 with funding supplied by the New York City Council's Veterans Mental Health Initiative. With council support, we have also been able to expand the number of centers of excellence in military care offered at our health centers. Staff at these centers are trained by the Veteran Advocacy Project to provide comprehensive, culturally informed care to mil military populations. We now have four military health centers of excellence at our Harlem, Long Island City, Sutphin Boulevard, and South Bronx Health Centers. 
Moving forward, we plan to designate two more health centers in Williamsburg and Tremont as military centers of excellence and significantly expand the number of patients we serve through the military health and family wellness program. As part of this effort, we plan to bring our integrated health van to new locations throughout the city and explore opportunities for expanding trauma-informed dental services for veterans at our health centers. We also plan to host a military families health and wellness panel in mid to late 2019, addressing best practices, challenges, and experiences serving and receiving care among military affiliated populations. We thank the chairman and the committee on veterans for their generous support on this project and initiative and look forward to continuing our work alongside the city council to better serve military populations throughout New York City. Thank you. Thank you. I just have uh, two questions. Sure. Um, you, if you don't have it now, you don't have to give it. Um, if you had, do you have, how many calls do you, how many referrals do you receive from VetConnect? Um, I can tell you that like actually. 2018. Um, so I have the data for beginning in year two, which is when we started receiving city council funding. Um, through VetConnect, about 11% of our referrals come through there. So 11% what? 11% um, is 15 patients. How many? 15 patients. 15, okay. The majority of our referrals come through internal staff, such as our social work team. Um, they identify a patient and then they refer them to this program. So how do you receive the information from VetConnect? Um, through our, ref we have a referral department and they get that information that comes in. Oh, so, so they go on VetConnect and they call yes. you directly and they, they let you know, oh, we got, I got your information from VetConnect. Um, okay, and uh, you receive direct funding from uh, from Thrive? Yes. I'm sorry, what? From Thrive. From the uh, Thrive NYC. Do you receive Oh, no, no, no. We received it um, through the city's uh, Veterans Mental Health Initiative, the expense funding. Oh, okay. Yes. From that thing. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, James, are you going to, you're going to, you're going to test, you're going to speak? So, we, we, uh, by the way, this guy got the, we're, we're I got the best smile. You got the best smile. <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to both uh, share the three minutes. Uh, oh, okay. Chairman, yeah. All right. So, uh, no, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, my name is James Hendon, um, Director of the uh, Veterans Future Lab, also accompanied by Kate Stryhall, our Deputy Director and our Community Manager in the space. You know, we both sit here before you as veterans, and uh, we say thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of the veterans here in New York City, uh, first and foremost. The... I'm going to defer to Kate in a minute, but first I wanted to take a minute to talk about the VFL. Uh, the Veterans Future Lab is an NYU-led incubator for aspiring and practicing entrepreneurs who are spouses of veterans or who themselves are veterans. Uh, we're the result of a public, private, and academic partnership. Uh, what makes us unique is that we are high touch. If you come into our space, we're going to work with you in person to help you help yourself get your venture to a better place. And a fact about us is that for our current incubator class, we have 20 veteran-run ventures. Those ventures have created 19 jobs, have earned $450,000 in revenue over a one-year period, and have raised $2.3 million over that one-year period. So we're doing a great job of teaching aspiring veterans about entrepreneurship, doing a great job of uh, supporting existing veteran ventures. We want to go a step further and incubate ventures from cradle to maturity, or from ideation to operations, and tackle an underserved segment in what by itself is an underserved segment. So that said, I'll defer, defer the rest of my time to Kate. So thank you again so much for your time. I know it's been a long one for y'all. Um, and thank you to James for the introduction. Through the FEVC program, we wish to create and bridge a gap that's already been well identified, which is uh, male-owned businesses versus female-owned businesses and the amounts of them. Uh, so. When a veteran is leaving the service, 12% of the men leaving service are gonna go on to create their own business venture, while only 5% of female veterans leaving service will go on to create their own business venture. And through the FEVC, what we wish to do is identify the obstacles and challenges associated with female entrepreneurship in general and break them down. And if we can't break them down, at least jump over it or walk around those challenges uh, in order to create more diversity within our veteran community and also within our entrepreneurship community. Uh, we want to do so by not only providing that hands-on touch, but helping them with resources. So if you have an idea, we're going to help you take that idea into a tangible, viable product. 
Uh, we're gonna offer you legal assistance. Uh, we are going to help you with market fit, uh, creating a website, uh, making sure you know what steps to take, how to take them, and also making sure that they're in a community that is safe for them, uh, that is surrounded by others like them, and making sure that we're just creating an environment and space that's for female veterans. Great, thank you. Do you work, uh, do you work with uh, SBS? So we, we work alongside SBS. So we know that we, uh, Sophia Musa, who runs their program for Fast Track for Veterans, uh, she's referred folks who've come through that program to us and we've assisted. And we've also uh, used the material they have as far as the Kaufman Fast Track material. We use that in our current vet class, Chairman. So yeah, we work alongside them very closely. Great, excellent, that's yeah. good to hear. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Chair Deutsch and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Samuel Malik, and I am the uh, Director of Policy and Legislative Advocacy for the New York City Veterans Alliance, member-driven and grassroots policy advocacy community bo building organization that advances veterans and their family members as civic leaders. I am pre presenting testimony on behalf of our members who are active stakeholders in this advocacy, and some of them are actually sitting here uh, in this room and at this table with me. The New York City Veterans Alliance was a key advocacy voice in the creation of the Department of Veterans Services as an independent agency, uh, and we have been the premier community voice advocating to grow DVS's budget to the current $5.2 million allotted for fiscal year 2020. Our membership strongly supports our continued work to set high expectations for the role of DVS in New York City and beyond. And there is much to be optim optimistic about as DVS continues to build a staff of impressive professionals and continue its impactful work like tracking and coordination of care and permanent housing for homeless veterans. But there is still much work to be done as has been noted in this uh, hearing earlier. Therefore, we make the following recommendations for DVS's fiscal year 2020 budget. At the outset, we regret to see the DVS's budget reduced uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. We have observed the mayor's budget proposal for DBS reflects an overall reduction of $63,238 to a total budget of 5.2 and 23 and some change. While the mayor has proposed larger budget cuts for DBS in the recent past, we remain firmly opposed to a reduction in the budget of this new agency that we fought hard to create and that has yet to fully, fully scale into robust and seamless and results-oriented services for veterans and their families across all five boroughs. If we consider the city's approximately 220,000 veterans and an estimated 250,000 spouses and household dependents who rely upon them, that's roughly one in every 17 New Yorkers who are impacted by veteran services. In, mayor, in the mayor's fiscal year 2020 budget of $92.2 billion, the proportional share of the city's funds we might expect to be targeted at veterans and their families would roughly be $5.4 billion. The current budget for DVS is less than a tenth of that amount. New York City's budget must not be balanced on the back of veterans and their families. A population that has been underserved for decades by our city's government and that DBS has only begun to reach out to over the past few years. And unlike many other agencies, DBS brings a clear return for the investment made. When veterans and their families are able to access more of the federal and state benefits and services that they have earned, it reduces the cost of city services for this population. And it also brings federal funding into those communities that need it the most. As it continues to build agency infrastructure and refine its mission and outreach, DBS has the potential to bring in a substantial return on the city's investment. With respect to DBS's staffing, we are pleased to see the inclusion of an HR generalist. It's an important step, and we look forward to the important work that that HR generalist will undertake. What is not included in the staffing proposal is an agency chief contracting officer. As we have stated in previous testimonies before the Veterans Committee and discussions with the Chairman, we strongly urge the Council to allocate funding in DVS's budget for a dedicated ACCO with a specialized expertise in the City's contracting and procurement processes. We believe AC uh, DVS would be enhanced by an ACCO with the right expertise, relationships, and sense of urgency for veteran priorities. Delays that have taken place over the last three years in bringing VetConnect NYC under DVS management would have likely been mitigated by in-house contracting and procurement expertise. 
An ACCO would also bring the capability of providing meaningful oversight of discretionary funding from the council to organizations serving veterans based on their experience and knowledge of the veterans community. We ask the committee, will you advocate for inclusion of an ACCO in DVS's budget? We also continue to call for more effective, transparent metrics for success in DVS's programming, as has been stated uh, and alluded to in, the pre in previous testimony and hearing. For example, Veterans pay, uh, Employment Pay for Success program should have been more robust metrics attached to it. The amount projected in fiscal year 2019 for the VA orchestrated program purposes a social impact investment pilot for New York City with payment by New York City for employment outcomes for veterans with PTSD. We appreciate the innovative program, but we urge the committee to ensure that the program is accompanied by robust metrics for success prior to any further funding. The DVS agency staff and programming are supported by New York City taxpayers. We believe there should be transparency in the form of more effective qualitative data reporting, and we strongly urge this committee to call for DVS to focus on enhanced data refining and more cost-effective delivery of information and services for veterans and the broader taxpaying public. We also ask that the information about the programmatic work being done by DVS in conjunction with funds raised under the Mayor's Fund for Advancing New York City be made available for public review. While not part of the city's budget, we realize DVS has been utilizing philanthropic funds for veterans programming through the Mayor's Fund. Veterans are not mentioned in last year's annual report for the Mayor's Fund, and we're interested in how we might learn more about the funding and how the city is utilizing it for benefit of veterans. We believe this would help create a further picture of DVS's programming and impacts as a city agency and build trust with the community it serves. We look forward to continued dialogue and partnership with DVS as it continues to grow and work towards serving the New York City veterans community. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Pending any questions, this ends my testimony. Thank you very much. Thanks and received. We'll work on some of these things. And uh, regarding ACCO, um, let's work together. Let's see what we can do. Great. Yeah. I look forward to it. I see you much. had a question, so I just want to answer your question. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Jody Rudin, Robert Wadiak, Lisa Colling, and Nicole Sikogna. By raise of hand, whose name did I mispronounce? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> we'll go clockwise. Ready to go? I'm Lisa Carling. I'm director of TDF Accessibility Programs, and thank you for this opportunity. TDF is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to bringing the power of the performing arts to everyone. This includes our city's veterans, too many of whom are missing from our audiences. In 2017, we created, with the city council's support, the TDF Veterans Theatre Going Program. The program provides tickets at no cost to New York City's former servicemen and women of all ages who have served in any branch of the armed forces and reside in one of the five boroughs. Included with every pair of tickets is an invitation to enroll in a one-year complimentary TDF membership that gives each vet the opportunity to purchase tickets for additional shows at greatly reduced cost. We partnered with 25 different veterans groups this year 16 of which were new, to distribute tickets to vets in substance abuse programs, shelters, transitional housing, educational programs, city organizations, community, social, and support groups. We've offered a total of 1,200 complimentary tickets to 12 different Broadway shows this season for veterans and their companions. In the Disney show pre-curtain announcements, they acknowledge the veterans, the TDF program, and city council funding, all of which brings spontaneous applause and cheers from the whole audience. 
We've also been able to schedule brief talkbacks with cast members after most of the performances which the vets have enjoyed. To enhance the experience, several of our partners have put together pre-performance events. The most memorable for me was Wounded Warrior Project, hosting a dinner at Dallas Barbecue before, beforehand for vets and their children who are going to Frozen on January 29. Sandy Kenyon from Channel 7 Eyewitness News was there, interviewed them, and did a great piece on it. Be it physical or invisible wounds, the simple principle of our program is that we believe that going to the theater is healing. It gives veterans a chance to come together as a community, engage with each other, feel appreciated, and enjoy a live theater experience. We are grateful to the New York City Council with a special thanks to Chair Deutsch for funding this program for a second year and we hope you will continue your support for the healing power of the performing arts. I would now like to introduce Bobby Wadiak, who is a veteran from Samaritan Village. Good afternoon, Chair Deutsch. I'm a United States Navy veteran from Samaritan Day Top Village Veterans Program. I, along with other veterans in this program, have been a beneficiary of the theater tickets provided by TDF Veterans Theater Going Program. Among these plays, we saw Donna Summer, the musical, The Play That Goes Wrong, Miss Saigon, and Kinky Boots. The reason I'm here today is to stress the importance of this program to us veterans. Ours is a program that has members of all five branches of the military. Among us, we have a Marine who was in the Beirut Marine Barracks bombing. We have soldiers and sailors who served in Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam. These plays that we've had the privilege of attending have been instrumental in interacting, I mean, integrating us back into society and have provided much needed stress relief. And I know I'm not just speaking for myself when I say that, all of us appreciate the feeling that we got we are, when we are thanked for our services with more than mere words. In closing, I would like one more time to stress the importance of this program and the services it provides to the men and women who have selflessly defended our freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I had the honor of uh, attending uh, some of those programs with the TDF, and it's really thank you for the, the great work you do on behalf of the veterans. And Robert, thank you for coming here today. It means a lot. Um, so thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Deutsch and Council staff. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Jody Rudin, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services organization. For more than 52 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are homeless or at risk to renew their lives through health, homes, and jobs. Each year, we serve nearly 15,000 New Yorkers, including hundreds of veterans. We are grateful to you, Chair Deutsch, and the City Council for giving Project Renewal $300,000 for homeless prevention services for veterans, support that has been crucial for us to help veterans across all of our programs. Your funding has allowed us to improve assessments and tracking of our veterans' clients, which is enabling us to serve them even better now. So far in fiscal year 19, we have provided health care to almost 220 veterans at our mobile medical vans and shelter-based clinics and through our psychiatry and substance use disorder programs. Veterans use our health care programs at a higher rate than our non-veteran clients. Their needs are complex and require coordinating services with many different organizations. As a result, their care is more expensive. These are men and women who have served our country we owe it to them to take care of them. I thank the council for recognizing this and supporting our work. 
Additionally, our employment programs, which have been recognized nationally, help veterans obtain and keep career path jobs. Our Next Step program provides job training, internship placements, interview coaching, and retention support. And our award-winning culinary arts training program places 80% of graduates in jobs, nearly twice the national average for similar programs. Both programs have helped veterans. One of our clients, Herbert, grew up in Queens and served in the U.S. Army. Herbert was also former, formerly incarcerated. In 2015, he became homeless. Herbert participated in our culinary training program, and when he graduated, he got a job as a cook. Thanks to this job, Herbert was able to move into his own apartment in Rosedale, Queens. No veteran should be homeless. We are proud that our permanent and transitional housing programs currently provide apartments to 50 veterans. Moving forward, we want to deepen our expertise working with veterans. We have an opportunity to enhance our services and provide more training to our staff so they can be more effective in working with our veteran population. We also want to collaborate with the VA healthcare system to improve continuity of care for homeless and at-risk veterans so we can better address their unique needs. The City Council played a vital role in helping to reduce veterans' homelessness. This tremendous progress has been possible because of the city's concerted investment and the work of nonprofit agencies it supports. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Hi, thank you to um, Chair Joyce and the City Council and the Veterans Committee for allowing me to be here today to testify in support of program funding for New York City's veteran population. My name is Nicole Saconia and I'm the Executive Director of Gallup NYC. We provide therapeutic horsemanship programs for our children and adults with disability, including at-risk youth and veterans in New York City. Horsemanship includes horseback riding, groundwork, and horse care. And our mission is to help riders in New York City with disabilities walk, talk, and learn, inspiring them to live their lives as fully, independently, and productively as possible. At the height of our season, we provide lessons to 686 individuals per week. And we operate our programs at four locations across the boroughs. And we're committed to serving low and middle income families, a majority of whom receive tuition scholarships. We have offered a veteran program for nearly 11 years now, open to all New York City veterans at no charge to them. Councilmember Deutsch, Speaker Johnson, and the entire City Council, with your generous support and that of the committee, and through the Veterans Initiative, we received funding this year for our growing veterans program. And funds are being used to support the free therapeutic horseback riding and groundwork program for veterans in Queens at our Gallup NYC Forest Hills and Gallup NYC Sunrise Stables in Howard Beach. Therapeutic horsemanship is effective with veterans in both physical and emotional rehabilitation, including for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and those with brain injuries. Our therapeutic horsemanship program for veterans focuses on the interaction with horses and helps improve skills in decision-making and self-regulation. Effective horsemanship requires leadership, and as one can imagine, many veterans respond well to opportunities to be leaders. It also helped veterans with PTSD get in touch with their emotions. Many veterans experience a hypervigilant state when they return, um, and it doesn't subside after they return home from military service, and it's often a result of PTSD. Consequentially, many veterans struggle with being able to relax and make vital connections with other people, and structured time with horses can be very helpful in veterans overcoming the tendency to be hypervigilant, and they learn to relax in the moment when they're around the horses. I know I do. <laughs> we offer programming to veterans twice each week at our locations in Queens, and the outdoor environment at our five-acre park site at Sunrise Stables provides a natural healing and a stress-relieving setting. And with your support and your continued support this fiscal year, our therapeutic program can continue to be offered at veterans at no cost to them. So thank you for your generosity to Gallup NYC and the generosity to the veterans of New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, it was great when I visiting uh, Gallup NYC. It was really nice. Yes, and thank the, you. the work you do and watching the veterans firsthand, um, having that relationship. I think I met Charlie the horse, you right? You did, my favorite yeah, Charlie. Charlie likes me. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Courtney Orr, uh, Tom Weber, Rhonda Sherwin. see you again. Um, hello and thank you Councilmember Deutsch and the Committee on Veterans for allowing me to testify today. My name is Courtney Orr and I am the Director of Individual Engagement at Roe New York. I am here to testify on behalf of Roe New York's veterans programs. Through the discipline of rowing, Roe New York transforms the lives of New Yorkers regardless of background or ability. Across our three program sites, we serve 270 middle and high school students from low-income neighborhoods 1,500 teens in public schools, and over 200 individuals with cognitive and physical disabilities, including our veterans program. Row New York's veteran, veterans rowing program provides New York City veterans with opportunities to experience the sport of rowing. The program is designed to help veterans avoid poor health outcomes, such as obesity and depression, by improving their physical fitness, including strength, speed, endurance, and mobility. Veterans also benefit from the opportunity to compete on a team, belong to a supportive community, and experience New York City's waterways. Rowing can be easily adapted to meet different ability levels, making the sport uniquely suited to para-athletes. Individuals with visual impairments, physical disabilities, and or cognitive disabilities can all excel as rowers. In the past, our adaptive programs have served veterans with a wide range of cognitive and physical disabilities, including but not limited to amputations, multiple sclerosis, blindness, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Our veterans rowing program has three activities, our recreational program, competitive para program, and indoor VA program. In our recreational program, participants learn the fundamentals of rowing and physical fitness, both on the water and indoor rowing machines. Our competitive para program meets three times a week to practice for competitive races which they participate in throughout the year. Lastly, we have our indoor VA program through partnerships with VA offices across the city. Row New York delivers indoor rowing instruction at local VA centers. Support from the city council will enable Row New York to continue delivering high quality programming for our underserved veteran community. And we count on the continued support and leadership of the committee on veterans to ensure that veterans throughout the city are given the resources they need to have positive mental physical health outcomes. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, my name is Tom Weber. I'm Director of Care Management at SAGE. Um, SAGE is an organization that has been around for 41 years now in New York City, and we provide services for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender older adults, and also uh, educate about them and their needs and do advocacy on their behalf. Um, we have a range of services across the city. We have five centers um, in Manhattan, well, Lower Manhattan, Upper Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, where we have daily hot meals, health and wellness programs, um, technology, cultural arts, socialization, et cetera. These are primarily DIFTA funded. We also have case management programs, social services, um, caregiver support, uh, friendly visiting, HIV positive programs, and the SAGE Vets program, which I oversee. The SAGE Vets program has been around for over three years. It was designed to actually um, help LGBT older veterans, 50 and over, to access veteran services. And for those who might have a discharge um, issue due to their sexual orientation, to work with them to get that um, discharge change so they would be able to access veteran services. Um, Sage Vets works with um, a variety of partners across the city, um, many of whom are in this room today, which we're very grateful for because we couldn't do it by ourselves. Um, legal entities, housing entities, other veteran service providers. Um, DVS and Chair Deutsch, we want to say thank you as well for um, having us at your uh, Veterans Roundtable and considering our our uh, request for city support. This program is currently funded through the New York State Legislature. 
um, but we have done a whole lot <laughs> with it um, um, in the city as well as, of course, across the state. So actually our Sage Vets coordinator, who would generally be here, is today actually being part of a, a human rights uh, conference that the State Office of Veterans um, is uh, producing today. So um, we currently have um, 370 veterans who are engaged in our various services, and uh, we're working with over 40 veterans around case management, legal, and other kinds of issues, hooking them up to vital services. Um, we attempt to be everywhere, at every place veterans are in New York City, just letting people know about our community and the needs of our veterans, um, which are vast. And everything else that has been said about veterans in general, in terms of uh, mental health, substance abuse, isolation, et cetera, and older um, veterans is exacerbated for our population. Um, so for the first time, we're asking for support from the city to help us with the program within the city, and uh, we hope you will consider our request. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Councilman Deutsch. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Rhonda Sherwin, and I am a veteran's financial coach. I'm an example of a non-veteran that has been brought into the community. Um, my only connection two and a half years ago when I be started as a financial, financial coach was my father-in-law, who is a 94-year-old World War II veteran. The, for the past two and a half years, I've been under the direction of the Veterans Financial Coaching Program, funded by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a federal agency. The program is ending on March 29th due to a lack of funding from the Bureau. I am one of 60 coaches around the U.S. that is affected by this closure. The news is very disappointing since it has proven to be a successful initiative within New York City and also nationwide. I started when DVS started. We've grown up together. Um, and I've been the single, the, the single veteran financial coach representative in New York City. I've participated in New York Serves, and I'm currently on NYC Vet Connect since the beginning of the position and have serviced clients through that portal. After March 29th, the program will no longer be on NYC Vet Connect. I am the only financial representative on NYC Vet Connect. While the federal program is ending, I'm seeking to continue the program on a local level. Managing finances is one of the most frequently mentioned issues that transitioning service members must deal with upon discharge. And it is also one of the issues that is most often not addressed before decisions are made or behaviors are established. This program is the only one of its kind in New York City, and it has been growing steadily. It's important to keep the momentum going as it is ever increasing in visibility and positive change for so many veterans and their families. I go out to the community and look for veterans. I learned early in my position that going into fairs and setting up an office is okay, but the vets will not come to you. You have to go out and find them, and that has been my differentiator. Under this project, I have serviced veterans at three residential shelters, Jericho Project, Services for the Underserved, Samaritan Village Daytop, Single Stop, all the local vet centers, Manhattan and Bronx VA hospitals, veteran advocacy projects, and, and even more. The current financial pro coaching program is the only structure that specifically services veterans in the capacity of a pure financial support system without selling any product or being connected with any financial institution. The metrics speak to the success of the program. I've met with over 200 clients and many more if one includes those that have participated in seminars. I've held over 300 individual sessions, which doesn't even include the informal follow-ups. And there is so much more I want to do. Connect with every CUNY student veteran group. Connect with other student veterans at other private colleges. Connect with veterans committees on community boards, which is something I've just learned about. And expand services at homeless and residential shelters, giving those vets purpose of what the future could look like once they, once they transition out into the community and increase my liaison with Manhattan and VA, Manhattan VA and the Bronx VA. I've already set up office hours and have, put conti and have continuing programs there. 
So my, my, re my request today is to ask the city council to allocate some funding for this program um, and figure out a way to, to keep the program going because we're really um, on a, a very good path to helping so many people. I thank you, Rhonda. Uh, we are going to have a, uh, a budget roundtable. Um, so I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out here today and, and for staying after 5 o'clock. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for staying after 5 o'clock. <laughs>